Hello, I am Mr. Dowling and I think that TOK is the best course ever. TOK is quite possibly the worst subject offered by the IB programme. I believe that TOK is designed to improve a student's critical thinking skills. TOK was designed by the Illuminati in order to make people think that they know things when in fact they don't. Because TOK asks students to think about various ways of knowing, such as emotion, I would argue that the purpose of TOK is to make students more emotional. I think that TOK is You have just encountered some various interpretations of the TOK course, some of them good, some of them bad, that is up to you to decide. Uh, but that leads me nicely onto this week's essay title, which is How can we distinguish between good and bad interpretations discussed with reference to the arts and one other area of knowledge? Okay, we now have our essay title. Let us break it down. Let's unbox it. So I have several boxes here. Uh, what is in the first box? Let's find out. So, the first word that I think is important in the essay title is how. This is another how question. We have looked at these type of questions before. Essentially, it is asking you for the ways, the methods of how to do something. Um, if I were to ask you, how do you tie your tie? You might say, well, I do it myself. I get my mother to do it for me. You have a single knot, a double knot, a Windsor knot, I don't know. But we need the ways and methods. Right, so what is in the next box? The next important word in this essay title is distinguish. And distinguish is basically how we tell the difference between A and B, if there is actually a difference at all. Moving on. A bigger box now. Let's find out what is in here. Okay, we have the words good and bad. Uh, and it's up to you in your essay introduction to define what you believe good and bad to actually be. Is it right versus wrong? Is it strong versus weak? Is it worthy of attention versus not worthy of attention? That is ultimately up to you. Wow, so many boxes at the moment, but I've saved the biggest box, the most important box, until the end. Okay, our final word is interpretations. And I think that this word can be interpreted in many different ways. There are different definitions of it. Again, it's up to you how you define this word. For me, interpretation is our version of the truth. As represented, in the stimulus that we are provided. So for example, we read a book, what is our interpretation of the truth of that book? We are presented with some data, what is our interpretation of those numbers? This is just one definition of interpretation. There are others, I might mention them later when I provide some extension questions. Um, but for now, this is the definition of interpretation that I am going to be following as I discuss this week's essay title. Okay, so now that I have unboxed the essay title, let's start to explore some of the possible ideas that uh, might come up in this particular essay. I'm just going to go through some of the thoughts that I have had, and I will cover a few different ideas, a few different real life situations, and then at the end, I will summarise it all and give you some clear points that you can take away and potentially include in your essay. So, how can we distinguish between good and bad interpretations? Discuss with reference to the arts, you must talk about the arts, and one other area of knowledge. Um, so, first of all, I would like to talk about an idea from Yuval Noah Harari. 
Uh, he is a very famous uh, writer nowadays. He has brought out two um, really successful books. One of them is Sapiens uh, and the other one is Homo Deus. If you read Homo Deus and you look at pages 258 to 275, 258 to 275, um, you will discover that Harari talks about the following. He talks about humanism and the arts. According to the humanist ideology, we should attach importance to the human being. So in the case of the artist or the arts, sorry, we should attach importance to the human beings who are engaging with that art. And um, this kind of reminds me of Roland Barthes and his idea of the death of the author. Might be something else that you want to check out. Um, but using a real life situation of a piece of artwork called the Phantom, which was basically a toilet that was displayed in an art gallery, Harari says that whatever somebody thinks about a piece of art is absolutely fine. Whatever interpretation they have of the art, whether it is art or not, whether it is good art or not, it doesn't matter, it's completely fine because at the end of the day, they are human beings and they are entitled to their own opinion. Whatever they think about a piece of art is fine as long as it doesn't cause anybody any harm. That is important. Uh, so in the arts, a lot of the time, our interpretations don't really affect other people. In other AOKs, it, it might actually have an impact on people, especially when it comes to things like the natural sciences, medicine, etc. So maybe in some AOKs, we need to be more careful. That's not to say that we don't need to be careful in the arts, because some art could be offensive. But on the whole, um, it doesn't matter as long as your interpretation doesn't cause anybody any harm. You can have any interpretation that you want, therefore there is no such thing as a good or bad interpretation. However, I would argue that some interpretations are just completely wrong, therefore bad. Uh, let's take the case of Rick and Morty, a TV show some of you might be familiar with. Um, there are lots of fan theories, fan interpretations of this TV show, Rick and Morty. Imagine somebody said that Rick and Morty is all about chickens. I would argue that that is a bad interpretation. It has no basis for belief. Um, it's not justified in any way. It doesn't seem to correspond with what we already know about this TV show. Um, that is not to say that all alternative, outside of the box interpretations are wrong and henceforth bad. Um, I would like to share with you this example. Um, Volkswagen, the TV company, uh, the, sorry, the, the car company, uh, once um, brought out a series of commercials that they would show in cinemas before a movie was shown. Um, this was part of their See Films Differently series. And in one commercial about Toy Story, you have this woman here who shares her interpretation of Toy Story. Now, we should all be familiar with the Disney Pixar movie, Toy Story. It's about those little toys that come to life. And according to this woman's interpretation, it is actually a coming of age tale about one pubescent boy's uh, sexual development. She offers quite a Freudian psychoanalytical perspective interpretation. Um, if you watch this video, it's only one minute long, uh, you might find her ideas quite convincing because she does connect it with various parts of the movie um, and she constructs her argument in quite a logical, reasonable way. Um, logic, reason is very important to interpretations in the arts, according to some people, and in certain contexts. Um, it's definitely more important when it comes to other areas of knowledge, uh, like the human sciences, uh, uh, for example. 
Uh, but this just gives you a glimpse of how uh, a unique interpretation can be offered um, that maybe uh, makes you raise a few eyebrows but can still be quite a good interpretation depending on your definition. Um, what we decide is good interpretation or bad interpretation um, may differ and as a result of that one thing that we have a tendency to do in humanity is come up with a criteria a criteria a checklist of standards of um, quality interpretation in this instance um, this is something that we actually see in um, English literature. If you think about an uh, IB literature and language course, uh, you will have a criteria that looks like that. They want you to interpret, but in order to get good marks, you need to be fuller, perceptive, you also need to be um, convincing and insightful. So these are some of the hallmarks that we might include in a criteria about interpretation. Um, obviously, whoever makes these interpretation, these criteria, these criteria, um, they should be held to account. Um, who is it whose opinions matter in the formation of these standards? Um, should other voices be appreciated? That is all up for debate. Uh, but nevertheless, this is just to show how we do sometimes develop criteria in order to say what is a good interpretation and what is not. Um, why is it that we use such a logical, reason-based process in an art-based subject like literature? Uh, I'd like to give you a little bit of history. Um, a lot of people think that English literature is a very old course a very old traditional academic subject. That is not necessarily true. The first English literature courses to be offered in British universities only really came into existence around about the year 1910. Um, so English literature as an academic discipline is quite a new field. Um, when it first was introduced to universities in Britain, there was a lot of backlash because people said, oh, this is, not where, this is not worthy of our attention. This is not an important subject. Um, you can't just sit around all day talking about books, similar to the kind of arguments we might have now about film studies, for example. Um, in order to justify that this is a real academic subject, uh, the people who were supporting English literature as an academic discipline, they had to decide on what books um, were worthy of study in an academic environment. So they produced the English canon of literature. And over time, we had this kind of criteria to help us distinguish between the good and the bad. Again, though, I should reiterate, what is included in such a criteria is up for debate. Um, who makes the decisions about what is included is up for debate. Uh, there are a lot of issues surrounding such criteria, uh, but nevertheless, they do exist. Um, sometimes, I'm going to tell you this as a teacher, I use a criteria to evaluate a student's um, interpretation of literature. And sometimes, I'm not 100% sure how to apply that criteria. Sometimes, I might have two students on the doorstep of a seven, uh, and I've got to decide, um, are these both seven, are they both six, is one a six, is one a seven. What I might naturally do in that instance is actually go through a process of comparing and contrasting. I might look at two interpretations and I might weigh up which one is the best. Um, so that is another thing that I think we do in order to distinguish between good and bad interpretations. We compare, we contrast, and from that, we evaluate which one is the strongest. Um, moving on, um, we could also have um, this idea of consensus. Um, whatever most people agree with, we then decide is the better interpretation. We see this in art, 
And we see this especially due to the advent of modern technology. So here is an example of a website, genius.com. On this website, people post lyrics of famous songs and they offer their interpretations of what the song actually means. So this is Beyonce, if I were a boy. Um, and somebody has posted here what they believe these lines to mean. And um, basically, people say whether they like this interpretation or not. The interpretation that has the most votes ends up being displayed on the page. That is the first interpretation that people see. And then that uh, ends up with the most traction going forward. Um, so we could argue that there is a lot of consensus behind our decision regarding whether an interpretation is good or bad. Uh, we also see something similar in other areas too. So you might be familiar with websites like Quora. Um, so somebody has posted here something about how do you identify and hire a truly talented product designer. Uh, people post their interpretations, their answers. People vote them up or down. Uh, the best answers go to the top. Um, you could easily imagine, and I'm sure you can find examples, of how other questions have been designed that relate to other areas of knowledge, for example, history. Um, another thing that I would like to talk about is um, the role of experts. Sometimes we just naturally assume that a certain person has a good interpretation because of their background, their history, their previous success, etc. In the art, you might look at somebody like Roger Ebert. Uh, he is now dead, um, but he was a very famous film critic who used to give films a rating out of five. Um, and basically, if a film came out and got a good rating by Roger Ebert, people would trust his opinion and they would maybe go and see that film. So, because Roger Ebert said that it was a good film, people believe his interpretation, they say it's a good interpretation, and they follow his advice. Um, in the field of literature, uh, uh, another example would be Howard Bloom, a very famous literary critic. Uh, I think he is now dead, but whatever his interpretation of a um, book would be, uh, people would tend to say it's a good interpretation. They might not agree with it, but uh, he had that reputation where people would say, well, if Howard Bloom said it, then there must be something to it. Um, look, this could be um, expert bias at play. Maybe these people shouldn't be trusted at all. Maybe we are led to believe that they are good because they have white hair, they are white. Um, but uh, maybe the reason that they are deemed experts is because, they, is because their interpretations are good in the first place. Nevertheless, it does cause this cycle where whatever they come up with, people will pay attention to it in the future. We can see uh, experts in other fields too. So for example, in history, you might have somebody like Sir Ian Kershaw. Sir Ian Kershaw is probably the most famous historian of Nazi Germany. Um, I remember a book came out a few years ago uh, called Blitzed, B-L-I-T-Z-E-D. In this book, a new, uh, quite amateur historian argued that um, the Nazis were all on drugs when they were making their decisions and they found historical evidence to back that up. Obviously, it would have been quite difficult for um, such an amateur historian to have his views listened to, but Sir Ian Kershaw said, actually, no, this person is onto something. And as a result, the book became more successful because people trusted Kershaw's interpretation of the book and the history. The natural sciences, I mean, come on, there's lots of people like Einstein out there, um, you know, because Einstein came up with a theory, it must be true, uh, it must be a good interpretation. Human sciences, we have people like Chomsky. In regards to mathematics, um, you might want to obviously talk about people similar to Einstein, 
um, you know, Pythagoras, uh, all these other famous mathematicians. Um, but I would like to use this as an opportunity to show one of the issues attached with experts. Um, sometimes just because an expert interprets numbers in a certain way, we tend to think it's true, people believe it, people act on it, and that shouldn't always be the case. Uh, there is a great real life situation uh, about a woman in England whose baby died, uh, her second baby died, her first baby died as well. Uh, basically, it went to court, and she said it was an accident. Um, according to mathematical information from a group of experts, uh, the chances of this actually happening by accident was something crazy like 1 in 72 million. Um, based on that data, the British court decided to find this woman guilty. But, um, after a little bit more digging, people found out that this particular interpretation that they initially believed was true because it was an expert was actually quite flawed and as a result this woman was released from jail. She was actually innocent. Uh, so that does show a little problem with um, experts and their interpretations. Uh, one final thing I would like to say about uh, interpretations as I'm just going through my ideas. Um, we need to think about the pragmatic value of a particular interpretation. Uh, what does this interpretation add to our knowledge that is useful? Um, at the end of the day, if it doesn't give us a new insight, if it doesn't give us something that is going to make our experience more pleasurable, if it's not going to actually help our lives in any way, maybe it's a pointless interpretation and therefore a bad interpretation. We should ask ourselves, what is the pragmatic value of this interpretation being offered? Okay, so I am now going to just summarise some of the points that I have already talked about. Uh, I might um, add a few little details along the way. Uh, I have written down my points here. You can notice I have a ThinkPad, by the way, because I don't like Apple. I don't want to be guilty of the bandwagon effect, but that's just a side note. Um, so first of all, uh, interpretations are neither good or bad. Uh, all are fine. That is the uh, humanist approach. Uh, maybe a good interpretation suits its context and purpose, uh, which is obviously going to be different for different AOKs. Uh, maybe we could say something like this for the art, but we can't say something like this for mathematics. Um, it can involve um, like a basis for belief, justification, logic, reasoning. Um, according to some interpretations, that is the best form of interpretation. You can hear the bell go in my classroom at the moment. I apologise. Um, criteria. Sometimes criteria is used, sometimes we compare and we contrast. And I have more. Consensus. Uh, I talked about consensus um, in regards to what people like on the internet. Uh, another thing that I forgot to mention, peer review. Um, obviously, a lot of academic interpretations are deemed more valid and hence good because they are actually peer reviewed by other academics. That is especially important in uh, mathematics, human sciences, natural sciences, but is also important in history, the arts. I talked about expert interpretation uh, and how the interpretation of experts is sometimes held in higher esteem and pragmatic value too. What does this interpretation add to our knowledge how is it useful if it's not useful maybe it's just not good okay i am currently leaning back and doing a limbo in order to try and get this whole whiteboard in frame uh, but i'm going to talk to you about some possible structures and um, first of all um, every essay should begin with an introduction uh, oh my back feels much better now um, one possible um, 
method um, or approach would be to tackle this via AOKs. So you would say AOK1, talk about various methods. AOK2, talk about various methods. It, I'm not the biggest fan of that approach. I would much prefer students to focus on the methods first and foremost. So there are two ways of doing that. Method one, followed by AOK1. -OK method two, followed by AOK2. -OK um, or alternatively, method one, talk about both AOKs. -OK method two, both AOKs. -OK um, and then at the very end, a conclusion. Don't forget to include all of your counterclaims, your multiple perspectives, your TOK terms and concepts, uh, and your implications in the course of your essay, irrespective of which structure you ultimately choose to do. And finally, ladies and gentlemen, I have some extension questions for you. Um, again, these are just designed to extend your thinking. You don't necessarily need to use these to build points. Um, maybe they might not appear in your essay, uh, but just to get you thinking on a more sophisticated level, who knows, they might feature as some kind of counterclaim. Uh, but question number one, is my definition of interpretation the only definition of interpretation? Uh, especially in the arts, we might talk about how a play is interpreted on the stage, uh, how it is almost transformed. Uh, we might even talk about language interpretation too. Um, you know, we have interpreters who interpret uh, language A into language B. Uh, so there might be other definitions of interpretation that you may want to consider. Number two, do all good interpretations do all good interpretations begin life as bad interpretations? And linked to that, do all bad interpretations have the potential to become good interpretations? Well, that is another video done. Uh, again, I really hope that this video has been useful to you. Um, at this stage in our journey, you should start to think about um, which kind of essay title or which essay title you actually want to focus on and start uh, delving in to that essay in a bit more detail. So many resources on YouTube uh, and on the internet available to you. Um, just type in TOK May 2022. You'll find lots of things, make use of them. Um, yeah, so that is essay title number five. We have one more to go, which I will try and do next week. Essay title number six, all about ethics. Usually at this point in the video, at the end of the video, I try and do something funny. I haven't got anything planned for today. Uh, so how about a joke? Uh, how many TOK teachers does it take to change a light bulb? The answer is four. One, who is in charge of counting how many people. Two, um, the second person, he is questioning the nature of a light bulb. The third person is thinking about the word change and what that actually means. And the fourth person is the one who actually changes the light bulb, but then smashes his head against the wall because that's what TOK does to you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I hope that you look after yourselves, you stay safe, and I hopefully will see you soon.